Another student of Simon Magus was Basilides. This Basilides became a famous Christian mystic and teacher in Alexandria, Egypt during the first half of the second century. Basilides is arguably the face of Christian Gnosticism. He takes Gnosis to another level. The logo of this channel, which is the symbol of Abraxas, comes from none other than Basilides himself. He taught that the great Archon, Magus Archon, known as Abraxas or Yao, was the unbegotten father and the Demiurge, who had the highest emanation of light in the universe and produced ions descended from his being, resulting in multiple heavenly realms and angelic powers, with the Jewish god Yaldaboeth identified as one of these angels. Abraxas had the head of a hawk, torso of a man, and legs of serpents, signifying the three elements, air, water, and earth. His name in Greek, Albersax, equals seven letters for seven planets and days of the week. Consists of three vowels and four consonants, which multiplies give the 12 lunar months of a solar calendar. The gematria of the name Abraxas equals 365. He designates Abraxas more distinctly as the power above all and the first principle or RK, the cause and first archetype of all things, and mentions that the Basilideans referred to 365 as the number of parts in the human body as well as the days in the year. He says that Abraxas, the RK, which is the monad, gives birth to the mind, nous, which is the duad or dyad, along with Sophia, the female principle of nous. This dyad produces the logos, which is Christ. The world, as well as 365 heavens, was created in honor of Abraxas, and that Christ was sent not by the maker of the world, but by Abraxas, his true father. Theos Hypsistos, who I mentioned earlier as a god worshipped by monotheistic Greeks, was also a title given to Abraxas, as well as God Almighty, Pantocrator. Pantocrator is used once by Paul in 2 Corinthians and nine times in the book of Revelation. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty, Pantocrator, and the Lamb are the temple of it. I will be a father to you, and you will be to my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty, Pantocrator. It is quite possible that this doctrine of Abraxas is rooted in deep ancient mystery rites. Eusebius, the church historian under Constantine, writes about a Bronze Age priest named Sanconiatin from 1200 BCE in Phoenicia, cited by Philo in Byblos in the first century, who says, The Phoenicians call it Good Daemon. In like manner, the Egyptians also surname Kenef, and they add that the head of a hawk, because of the hawk's activity, Ipice also, who was called among from the chief hierophant and sacred scribe, whose work was translated into Greek by Arius of Heraclipolis, speaks in an allegory word for word as follows. The first and most divine being is a serpent with the form of a hawk, extremely graceful, which, whenever he opens his eyes, filled with light in his original birthplace. But if he shuts his eyes, darkness came on. Epheis here intimates that he is also of a fiery substance, saying he shone through, for to shine through is a peculiar to light. From the Phoenician Phoricides also took the first ideas of his theology concerning the god called by him Ophion, concerning the Ophianade. Moreover, the Egyptians described the world from the same idea, engraved the circumference of a circle of the color of the sky and fire, and a hawk-shaped serpent stretched across the middle of it, and the whole shape is like our theta, representing the circle as a world, and signifying by the serpent, which connects it to the middle of the good daemon. Zoroaster, also the Magian, in his sacred collection of Persian records, says in express words, and God has the head of a hawk. He 
is the first, incorruptible, eternal, uncreated, without parts, most unlike all else, the controller of all good, and he is also the father of good laws and justice. Self-taught, natural, and perfect, and wise, and the sole author of the sacred power of nature. Eusebius inserts this passage just after explaining the mystical sacrifice of the Phoenicians in which El, the god of the Hebrew Bible, known to the Greeks as Kronos, sacrifices his only begotten son as a ransom to the avenging daemons. Eusebius argues that this was a portent of Jesus Christ being crucified as a ransom for the sins of mankind. Basilides asserted that it was knowledge or gnosis, not faith, that led to salvation. This special knowledge or gnosis was an esoteric truth revealed to humanity by the divine figure of Jesus Christ. To Basilides, faith had no role in achieving salvation. He regarded faith as simply the soul's approval of concepts that don't arouse the sense due to their absence. Furthermore, he saw faith as an innate attribute, not a deliberate choice, suggesting that individuals inherently recognize truths intellectually without the need for proof. Basilides also seem to link various levels of honor with one's natural faith. Basilides' own scriptural collection featured a unique gospel in addition to the Gospel of John, which explicitly excluded the epistle of Titus as a forgery and incorporating only selected letters from the Pauline corpus, which he thought were authentic. His canon also included a specific text believed to have been authored by Basilides or his immediate disciples, such as the interpretations of the Gospels and the Exegetica. In contrast, the established Christian canon, it omitted the Synoptic Gospels, Mark, Matthew, and Luke, deeming them incompatible with perfection of John's Gospel, which incorporates Christ as the Logos and Sophia as Zoe, ascending from the Father, who is Abraxas. Like Simon Magus, Paul and the Carpocratians, Basilides' influence on the Church of Rome as well as the Church of Alexandria was massive. In particular, the Sethians and Valentinians who shared common ideas about God and creation and also used Pythagorean math and Platonic philosophy to construct their Christian theology. A central text among the Sethians and Valentinians was the Apocryphon of John, an early Christian text revealed to the Apostle John that gives the secret account of creation. The narrative opens with John immersed in sorrow and confusion following the death of Christ. However, Christ manifests before John, transforming in appearance and soothing his distress with a cosmic vision. The highest divine principle is the monad, an ultimate divine entity described as a singular sovereignty with no higher power. He embodies the absolute, the everlasting, the boundless, the flawless, the sacred, and the self-sufficient. His existence surpasses all understanding and is beyond any definitive measurement or description, existing in a state of unimaginable perfection. The monad brings forth a dyad, a female divine aspect known as Barbello. From his contemplation. She is known as the initial thought and the monad's reflection. While Barbello is feminine, she is also referred to in both maternal and paternal terms, embodying the concept of the original parent and is characterized by a blending of masculine and feminine traits. As the foremost in hierarchy of divine beings called the Ions, Barbello's interaction with the monad results in the emergence of additional ions, as well as the aspects of light and mind. Light, synonymous with Christ and referred to as Christ the Autogenes, works alongside mind, or nous, in a creative capacity, honoring Barbello and the monad by generating more ions and forces. 
the narrative's harmony is disturbed by an ion named Sophia of the Epinoia, who unilaterally embarks on a creative venture without the monad spirit or a consort collaboration. Her thought gives rise to Yaldoboeth, an imperfect and malevolent being with the lion in head and a serpent body. Sophia, recognizing the flawed nature of her creation, attempts to hide Yeldaboeth, keeping him oblivious to the higher realms of the Ions. Despite his solitary origin and lacking the monad spirit endorsement, Yeldaboeth possesses sufficient power to emulate the creative acts of the superior Ions, spawning a legion of Archons with the similar deficiencies in crafting a lesser world for them. Made from darkness, yet infused with light, pilfered from Sophia, wisdom incarnate. This realm, neither fully dark nor light, is a murky creation. In his ignorance, Yaldoboeth proclaims himself the exclusive and envious deity of this domain. Upon realizing her mistake, Sophia expresses remorse. The spirit of the monad and other divine powers and ions seek to redeem Sophia and her aberrant creation. In this attempt, Yeldaboeth and his Archons are startled by the monad spirit, and an image of this spirit is inadvertently imprinted on their domain surface. Eager to capture this essence, they fashion a human, Adam, in its likeness. Sophia and entities from the higher order perceive a chance to recover the trapped light within Yaldaboeth's dominion and Adam. They deceive Yaldaboeth into instilling his spiritual essence into Adam, enlivening him and simultaneously depleting Yaldaboeth of the light derived from Sophia. Yaldaboeth and the Archons, observing Adam's radiant intellect and superiority, attempt to restrain him. They place him in Eden, a deceitful paradise filled with sin and death, hiding the true knowledge that can liberate the light within. Christ confides to John that he prompted Adam to taste the fruit of knowledge and reveals Eve as a helper dispatched by the higher order to free the light imprisoned in Adam and Yeldaboeth's creation. As the story unfolds, Yeldaboeth strives to recapture the essence of light, encouraging procreation to craft new bodies filled with a false spirit which deludes humanity, keeping them in darkness and servitude. John and the Savior engage in a dialogue where Christ elaborates on who will attain salvation. Those touched by the true spirit will be saved, while those ensnared by the false spirit will face condemnation. Christ, as an emissary for the higher realm, reveals his mission to awaken and save those trapped in Yaldaboeth's shadow marking the enlightened the special seal that protects them from death. The Savior concludes with a warning. Profiting from these divine secrets would incur a curse. The Sethians, who produced this work, were a group of Christians that have their roots in pre-Christian times before Jesus, among groups known as the Canaanites and Ophites, who existed in Syria, Palestine, and Armenia before coming to Alexandria, Egypt. They were said to have became Christians after meeting Peter and Mark. Their predecessors, the Cainites, were a group of Jewish Gnostics who believed that the Old Testament God was evil and that Eve was the savior and that Cain was the hero because he tilled the land, was a vegetarian, and did not believe in blood sacrifice of animals to appease a demonic god. Along with the Ophites, they believed the serpent in the garden was Sophia, wisdom incarnate, who came to save the world with Gnosis. They, along with the Sethians, taught that Christ on the cross was analogous to the serpent on the cross that Moses placed in the desert to avert from harm. The serpent on the rod was a serpent coiled on the tree in the garden and Christ on the cross was the fulfillment of this prophecy. And as I stated before, the Gospel of John was a favorite among these groups, which also states, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, 
so the Son of Man must be lifted up. John 3, 14. They also believed that Judas was a hero who was given the most important task by Jesus to turn him in so he could become the sacrifice of the world. They produced the Gospel of Judas, which explains how Jesus met secretly with Judas to tell him that he was the greatest among the disciples, but that he would be remembered by the world who has no gnosis, and that he would be called the worst, and that they would remove him from the twelve. The Sethians employed a range of Middle Platonic and Zoroastrian metaphysics in their writings. They also had a text attributed to the grandfather of Zoroaster, whose name is Zostrianos, that explains the five levels of attaining salvation through five types of people, which was revealed to him by the angel of Gnosis. The first type of person is materialistic, with a dead soul mind and body and they suffer and are consumed by demons the second type is materialistic but has an immortal soul and they forget their eternal god and associate with daemons third type the sojourners are far from wicked deeds if they possess an inward discovery of truth the fourth type is the one that repents renounces dead things and desires immortal mind and soul and they can receive another conception in every attainment. The fifth and most powerful type is the saved person who has grasped the image that changes in every situation and can become divine. Zostrianos offers up praise to God and asks the angel of Gnosis for wisdom about the dispersion of the saved type of person who is mixed with and divided from them. The angel of Gnosis tells him, some souls need help to escape reincarnation, and if not, they will keep descending into generation and become speechless due to the clutches of the body. To avoid this fate, there are specific powers appointed for salvation. These powers are perfect living, concepts that will save whoever receives them, passing through the world in every ion. Additionally, the text describes the self-generated ions as eternal lights that possess a variety of beauty, trees, plants, human beings alive with every species, immortal souls, every shape and species of intellect, gods of truth, angels dwelling in great glory with an indissoluble body and ingenerate offspring with unchangeable perception. These ions are perfect and individually complete, and at each ion there is a living earth, a living water, luminous air, and unconsuming fire. Zosterianos explains that being baptized five times by the powers of the self-born Thanes caused him to become divine. Zosterianos urges the holy seed of Seth to awaken their divine aspect, seek salvation by choosing the light over darkness. 